The officer, Pat Healy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a quick word about our hosts. I thought it was a brave selection putting the banking tech guy up first after lunch when the carbohydrate is really settling in. But I hope I'll be able to reinvigorate the audience with um, what I think is a particularly exciting story about what Deutsche Bank are up to. So I haven't got long, so let's get into it. OK, a bit of context. I've been in software an awfully long time. I've been in finance almost as long. I left finance for about seven years to do my own thing, and I didn't quite make that early retirement that I aspired to. However, I did walk away with a decent degree of commercial acumen. I'm still a bit of a geek. My sons employ me using chocolate as bait to build them 3D games. I frighten my mother with my latest virtual reality game. I give my wife's vacuum cleaner automation it probably never needed, but it's a hell of a ride. And when I've got a bit of spare time, I like to indulge in Iron Man. And that's that ridiculously long masochistic triathlon, as opposed to the Marvel comic superhero. Um, although I have thought about building the suit, and it looks kind of cool. I joined Deutsche Bank in July of 2015. Uh, to be the CTO for what was then called Infrastructure and Shared Technology Services. The role appealed to me because I could take some of the commercial acumen I'd learned from my past, some of my geekiness and all of the software engineering background that I have, and apply it to an infrastructure organization and see what would happen. Now, subsequently to joining, I realized I had three roles. And the first one got a little bit confusing. Infrastructure and shared technology services, as is um, the, 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 the theme these days, got renamed to Chief Technology Office. And that made me the CTO for CTO. However, my boss then got the title of Group CTO, which made me the CTO for the CTO of CTO. Or for the Star Wars fans out there, C3TO. And my boss, clearly, slightly shorter than me, C2T2. I also preside with a group of my uh, CTO colleagues over enterprise architecture. So not only do I preside over the CTO's architecture and strategy and direction, but also the bank-wide enterprise strategy and direction. That gives me unique insight into what the customer really wants and what the problems are that we have and the direction we need to move in. And finally, I have a day job as well, which is running engineering services, which is all about software development lifecycle, processes and tools, application and web hosting, database hosting, and some messaging and other middleware for good measure. Deutsche Bank itself, very large global player in many countries around the world, moving an awful lot of money around on a daily basis. Has a healthy revenue line of 30 billion euros a year. But some macro trends have emerged in recent years that have challenged that revenue line, but also presented a certain degree of opportunity. Uh -huh. Right, macro trends. Increasing regulatory requirements. There won't be a single person from financial services that doesn't have regulation fatigue. It doesn't seem to ever abate, and it is continuing strong, and that has massive implications on not only our business, but also technology that underpins it. I think we all agree that the economic outlook is somewhat volatile at present with big changes not only going on in Europe, um, but across the world. Increasing competition, those startups, those little ankle biters are starting to gain some real traction. Okay? They had the clean sheet of paper, they didn't have the legacy debt, and they've moved forward particularly quickly. Increasingly, we start to hear of CEOs of financial institutions starting to call their companies technology companies, not banks per se. They're technology companies with a banking license, or we need to think like technology entrepreneurs. Finally, technology is seen to have actually an ability to increase that growth. Actually, it's not just a cost center anymore. Consumer expectations. We've seen a massive change, an impact of what the iPhone and devices like that have had, and particularly within banking. Mobile banking alone, in pre my previous incarnations in other institutions, we couldn't shut branches fast enough due to footfall drops that were beyond expectations. 
And finally, the evolving technology landscape. It, doesn't, it seems like there's not a single day where I don't you know, go and read a blog or go online and see there's a new emerging technology or version X plus one or something else I need to look at or something else that may have a big impact that's coming from the consumer space than coming into the financial services space that I may need to make a big bet on. Which ones do you make that bet on? Five-year, ten-year bets, big investments. Quick word about the alien head. As you can tell, I was buried in Wibdings and Wingdings character fonts for this deck, and I lost the will to live trying to find something that would signify evolving technology landscape. But I did stumble across this alien head, and I believe it's a world first in a banking deck that there is an alien head presented. So I thought it was a bit of fun. On we go. So my initial observations. The organization wanted to move pretty quick. It needed a strategy out of me in a short period of time, so I went out there and lifted up the carpet. It was enormously complex, extremely heterogeneous. There was no lower common denominator of architecture across any app. We were 80% outsourced at this point. We were getting function back, but we weren't adhering to any architectural principles or guidelines, which meant that we ended up with technology solutions that were completely different from each other, that required a lot of people to manage. We have N thousand applications out there. And I say applications in quotes because we argue perennially about what the hell an application actually is. What we do know is we have many of them, well, at least those application IDs. All of that runs on about 45 major operating systems. I'm not, called, I'm not talking about service packs here or smaller versions. We have an aspiration to reduce that to four, two versions of each of the major operating systems, one of which clearly is Linux for us. Finally, we have N hundred thousand cores of compute. And the kicker is they're at single digit utilization. So this really piqued my interest because immediately when I arrived, I thought this is going to be a time to market thing. You know, we've got, to, we've got to solve for that. But when I saw this, I knew there was a prize on the table that was definitely worth looking at. Why is this? Why do we have this kind of utilization? Well, it's quite simple. We create a process that is so brutally hard to get through for you to get infrastructure that you actually look at swimming the Atlantic using your ears as propulsion as an easier option. By the time that hardware arrives, you forgot what the hell you wanted it for anyway. So we needed to look at that and look at that very closely. Thankfully, the bank was already on a bit of a journey of technology transformation. Information security, you know, cyber threats, data, we copy it everywhere, every day, billions of rows, sorting out the governance and data architecture once and for all for the organization. Core platform simplification, understanding the business process, understanding the application landscape that supports that process, finding that duplicate functional capability that exists in more than one app, and then identifying where that function sits within a process, where it sits within a data flow and those non-functional requirements that drive you to a singularity of function that you hope to encapsulate, take away, and project up as a microservice, and then you can let the rest of the, the applications beneath that fall away. Digital workplace, oops, sorry, zero intervention production. With this heterogeneous estate, a lot of people have a lot of fingers in the pies, and there are a lot of manual activities trying to keep these applications going or released or otherwise. This is driving towards automation of that digital workplace, better collaboration tools, better working environment, et cetera, and infrastructure transformation, consolidation of data centers, uh, infrastructure providers, et cetera. And we'd already started on that journey, outsourcing our retail data centers to IBM, and more recently to HP, who have become DXC for the, um, for the wholesale organization. The thing that was missing, we called everything as a service. It, it basically driven from provider abstraction we get our infrastructure from HP and IBM today. In the future, we want to drive towards the public cloud. We are thinking about best execution venue. We want a capability that will allow us to select our provider in real time, if at all possible. If that provider is giving us the right risk and cost profile for that particular workload, we want to move towards it. So we're going to need to move further than infrastructure as a service. And this is where PaaS comes in. PaaS drives utilization up 
through multi-tenancy. You take those servers back, and then you offer the capability of running a workload at an SLA. We don't talk about infrastructure anymore, workloads and SLAs. And the interesting thing is we do have some history here. So something I didn't talk about in my initial observations was I discovered we had a bit of a PaaS. It was a homegrown PaaS. It didn't have some of the capabilities that you'd expect out of a PaaS, the elasticity and you know, other resiliency factors, but it was good enough. And it had inspired a group of developers to drive their applications towards it because it gave them environment very quickly. So much so that 20% of the bank was already on it. So I knew that we were onto something here. And if we could provide those reusable building blocks, get people to build business capability and deliver it quickly, and then drive multi-tenancy, we would get those, that cost down as well as giving that kind of efficiency angle. Finally, we need an API layer so that we could start to build and expose APIs so that new applications could be made out of API composition and reuse. The left-hand side of this one slide uh, is all about driving CI, CD. There's no point having a great environment if you're letting any old rubbish into it, or you've actually created a wall so high that you can't even get in to use it. So we looked at all of the controls that we have as a regulated entity and drove automation through every single one, and that is the program we're doing now. So if you do the right thing by the organization, you can get straight into production as fast as possible. The slide itself was what we got presented to the board. It was landed. They wanted a PaaS-first approach, so this came from the top down. We called it the A0. Why? Because that's the size of paper we print it on, and then we stick it in every coffee area, because email seems to be something that people don't read anymore. So our strap line is ideas to production in a day, safely. Progress, and there's been a lot. So from January 06 to January 16, we managed to get 20% of the organization onto the PaaS. And then we decided we needed additional capability. So we actually wanted a decision that the entire organization stood behind. So we got all the CTOs and all the CIOs and all of their trusted advisors in a room and said, what do you want from your PaaS in the future? And then to take any religion out of it, we employed a third party who was a specialist in this space. And they took all of our requirements and baked them off. And we ended up with one. You can guess which one that is. Otherwise, I wouldn't be stood here today. We went into POC, and it worked. We could move workloads between providers, and we liked that. Then we went into beta very quickly by September, while I was busy doing all of the commercial stuff. But what we started to notice was that loads of teams were turning up with their developers and saying, I want to know about this. Use my guys. Help accelerate. This is very novel for us. Excellent. By December, we went live in our HP data centers in London. And very quickly after that, we were in a position to officially launch. However, momentum had got to such a point that we already had people live before the launch event. So I stood up when we did the launch event where I was going to announce a competition for the first person in production, and then I had to retrospectively give an award out for someone who didn't even know they were going to receive it because they were already live in the environment. We knew we were onto something when we were having that kind of momentum. And then two weeks ago, we realized that dream of provider agnosticism by going live in our IBM data centers in Germany. So we've now got two providers and data centers in two different countries. And the interesting thing about what we went live with, which was an API that had huge business value and, and uh, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of excitement around, was that the environment that we were building out in Germany wasn't quite ready in time for all the development and testing to be, to be done. So we developed and tested within our OpenShift uh, environment which we've internally branded as Fabric. Um, the testing was complete, and then we single-click deployed into another data center from another provider because it looked like one big homogeneous cloud, and it worked. And that got us really exciting because then we can add more and more providers to that. And today, we have 300 projects in the queue ready to go. Those 300 projects originally would have required a server each. Today, they're running on 50 cores of compute, which is just over four VMs. So we're realizing that cost, and we're also realizing the, the, the benefit of, the, of that throughput. Last year, we carried on, however, selling our old PaaS as well, because we said we will migrate those customers free of charge onto the new PaaS. You won't have to do anything. And from the demos this morning, I've got an idea of how I can even shortcut that further. So they adopted, and they adopted hard. And we grew by 50% in a single year to 30% adoption. A third of the bank was now on that PaaS. And this year, we're going to drive that to 40%. 
truly exciting progress. The future, we think, based on what we can see, that 85% adoption, which is our aim, because we believe that 85% of the technology within our organization is commodity enough to go onto this platform, will ultimately reside on about 20% of the infrastructure that it does today. We're going to add public clouds, uh, plural. Why just one? It's infrastructure as a service for us, best execution venue, move to the venue with the cheapest cost at the right risk profile for that workload. We're reimagining grid. This is a, something new for us. We have enormous compute farms out there, big monolithic blocks of compute. And people are saying, how can we do this differently? The cost is unbelievable. And we're starting to see some really interesting results. But this is quite nascent in this space. We're driving full automation across all of our CI CD pipelines. So all those controls are met, so developers don't have to worry about which regulation they have to cover, which CISO rule needs to be done. That will be in place this year as well. And finally, the carrot flavored stick. I couldn't find a web ding for carrot. I couldn't find a web ding for stick either. But I think the smiley face is just right, because that signifies really how happy our customers are. And if I was going to use a stick, it would be to beat away the crowds that are overwhelming us at the moment to use this platform that we've created, because as far as they're concerned, it's all carrot. And once you've won the hearts and minds, that is the biggest challenge of all. Thank you very much.